Hi, NARC Troopers. I had a minute and I thought I would talk to you about something that I've been learning about lately uh, a little bit more. Um, I was listening to a lecture about ontological insecurity. Ontology is the study of how we perceive ourselves in the universe, our place in the world. And to be able to do that, we have to have some concept of where we begin and end and where the reality around us also begins and ends. Um, and for the narcissist and for uh, other cluster B uh, people, it's often very difficult to uh, have an accurate uh, perception of, of what that is, what, where we fit and where others begin and end. In fact, borderlines are known to uh, just absolutely surrender themselves 150% to their uh, external partner in hopes that that person is going to give them uh, some kind of identity, meaning, um, and that person becomes enmeshed um, with the borderline personality so that they're sort of functioning as, as one uh, unit because one subsumes the other, consumes the other, co-ops the other's life, and they become sort of um, uh, one. And, you know, when, when people talk about that, you know, even in, in marriage vows, the two shall become one flesh, things like that, that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, you know, it's very romantic. It, it sounds good. And for people who suffer from dependent personality or disorder, attachment issues and borderline, uh, ultimately the goal is to have that unification of uh, body, mind, and soul with another external person who is going to uh, bring them to life um, and make it um, to where, you know, that's their everything. So let's talk about the narcissist real quick. What about them? What about their, how they see themselves, the ontologically speaking? Both the narcissist and the borderline have ontological insecurities in the, in the sense that they uh, do not feel complete. Uh, they have trouble with self-validation. They require validation outside of themselves. And what does that look like, you may wonder? Um, with the narcissist, they take a snapshot of the person that is outside of them, and they internalize that picture, that photograph, and they heavily Photoshop that uh, to make that person idealized, to make that person perfect. And that's what happens in that idealization stage at the beginning of the cycle of narcissistic abuse. They, they take that picture and it becomes an interject in their head so that they are not really interacting with anything outside of themselves because they can't, um, you know, whereas the borderline interacts with things outside themselves all the time, trying to get validation and identity and meaning in their life that they can't summon for themselves. The narcissist brings the outside in and just um, uh, takes it in that way so that by the time you get into their head, that's not reality. That's not even really you. The, the way that they see you has been altered to fit whatever their narrative is for their magical thinking and their fantasy life that they live. They, the way that their brain is um, constructed or dysregulated or however you want to say that, it does not allow them to really fully participate in real life. There are layers of, um, of delusions almost. There are layers of, of things that are twisted and convoluted and embellished and uh, maybe discounted or somehow altered so that the narcissist's idea of reality is quite skewed. It's quite not reality. It's not the real world that, that everybody else lives in. And so 
<coughs> excuse me, still have that lingering cough. <coughs> so I think what we want to um, stamp here is the fact that um, the narcissist is not grounded in reality in any way. Ha they are incapable of seeing it, experiencing it, and living in it. And so they have this alternate reality that they have constructed that is real to them. You can't tell them it's not. And in the beginning, when they first meet the person that they are are going to um, partner with, this, this source of fuel and supply, they idealize them. They, they, this is the person who's going to make everything okay. This is the person that is good to me, who, who accepts me and loves me unconditionally, and they're wonderful. And the way that they put that picture of you in their head is the one that they interact with throughout the whole relationship. It's never really you. They're never really present in that moment, in that reality, where you live, assuming that you're a neurotypical. Um, and so for many neurodivergents, their idea of reality is not the same. And it's very hard for people who don't live in that alternate reality and who have not experienced something like that. It's very hard for them to understand, like, how could that be? You know, you play by a certain set of rules. You experience life in a certain way. And, and a lot of things are causal in the sense that something happens and something happens to follow as a consequence, but that's not how the narcissist sees it. So on an ontological level, the way that the narcissist sees themselves uh, in the world that they live in, it is, it is not, it is altered. It is insecure, it's unstable, it's constantly changing and not in a causal kind of way in relation to any direct action that would summon a reaction or a consequence. Not like that. It's, it's the, the um, you know, sometimes there's, there, there are uh, confabulations, fabrications of made up things that aren't even real. They're not even real, but the narcissist believes they're real. And to him, there's no way you can convince them that it's not because that is the reality they are experiencing, even though it's an alternative reality. It's a different um, experience for them. Um, so I wanted to um, talk about that because I think how we see ourselves in the world is important. The narcissist, you're like a paper doll. You're like... Um, you're like an idea that has some kind of shape that they've constructed in their own head. And even through the relationship, that's what they're reacting to and, and, and interacting with. And when you're gone, when they have discarded you or, um, you know, when you have managed to escape, that's still how they see you. And they have colored you bad at that point. You're, you're, uh, the bad guy. You're the, the awful one. You're the, crazy one. You have to be all of that. They have to devalue you, discount you, slash your worth, you know, destroy you and paint you as the bad guy because that's the only way they can wear the white hat and be the good guy. That if they looked at the reality of their actions, what they've done, how much harm they've caused, they couldn't have the grandiosity and entitlement and all of that 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 narcissists are known for. They wouldn't be able to live with themselves, but because they're able to somehow turn you into, um, you know, the bad guy in every possible way based on nothing. It could, you know, the whole thing could be fabrication or maybe, you know, 5% truth and, and then the rest of it, they just run with it and make up this whole thing that never happened. And it was, it's not real. They create memories that never happened. They do what is called revisionist history. They rewrite history after you're gone, even while they're in the relationship. When they look back, what they're seeing is not real. It, it's not what happened. It's a history that, that never existed. And I think it's really important to uh, know that about the narcissist because 
you know, a logical, rational person is trying to sort out all of this and make sense of it. But what you fail to realize is that you can't make sense of what is nonsensical. You can't relate to a person who is out of reach because they live in an alternate reality. You can't play by rules that someone else has turned upside down on their head. And then to compound the problem, they have no remorse, no guilt. They have no empathy. They don't, it doesn't hurt them to hurt you. They don't give it a moment's pause. Uh, and if they do, it's like you deserved it. They're punishing you for being so bad for doing so many horrible things to them that, of course, you never did, right? You never did those things, but they believe you did. It's not like they're just saying that, but they know better. I, I don't think so. I think that, that they are very self-delusional. They can make themselves believe whatever they need to, and I don't even think they choose to do that. I think it's like a, a manifestation of the disease of the mind that they have. They are mentally ill, uh, and, you know, the sickness, the, the, the narcissism, what it has done to their brain makes it so that that's just the response. Sort of look at it this way. It's like if a schizophrenic person is having auditory or visual hallucinations, right? And you tell them there's really not a pink polka dotted elephant sitting in that chair over there. That person who's having the auditory and visual, um, hallucinations is going to think you're crazy. They see it. It is very real. You know, they, that pink polka dotted, dotted elephant is right there in front of them. And every fiber in their being knows that it is real. And what are, you know, you're the nutty one. You don't see that elephant sitting there. What's wrong with you? And that's the way the narcissist is, you know, to them, it is very, very real. Whatever they need to believe, whatever their illness makes them believe, I believe it, that is what is in control. It's not them. Their illness is in control, just like the illnesses of some other people are in control of them. Um, yeah, so that's really something we need to think about, the, the whole... And, and that word ontology, it's not important that you remember that. I think it's kind of cool because I like words. I'm an English teacher, right? Um, but to think about how we perceive ourselves in the world, you know, who we are, how we, how we are, how we interact with people and with systems, how we fit into the framework of the culture and the society in which, with which we have to coexist with. You know, that is interesting fodder for the mind. Um, but, you know, the narcissist cluster B people, their ontological perceptions of their place is so off target of what is really happening that there's no way to really process or understand that. It's, it's, it's the pink elephant. Just leave it alone. They're always going to see that and they're going to know that that is their reality and there's no um, persuading them otherwise. They can't see it, anything else. And uh, the way that they experience the world around them is not what you think. It, it's impossible for a person who's not like that to imagine how could that be, but um, it is. And, and there we have it. Another little tidbit of something to help us understand what we're dealing with. So stop banging your head against the wall that it's impossible to, to accomplish what you think you're trying to do with a narcissist that you're going to heal them or help them or have some kind of breakthrough. It's not happening. They're gone and they have surrendered themselves to this illness that has taken over and it's driving that car. So right over the cliff and they, you know, that's, there's nothing you can do to stop it except jump in the car with them and both of y'all do a Thelma and Louise. I don't think that's what we want, right? Uh, that's not the ending that we want. So let's keep working on ourselves one foot in front of the other, trying to reclaim a life and an identity in reality, grounded in this 
reality that is all around us. And you know, reality right now isn't easy. It's really hard. There's a lot of scary things happening, change, um, uncertainty, danger um, in our world. And sometimes that fantasy world of the narcissist seems pretty appealing. Let's go live in La La Land. At least we don't have to deal with all the things that that reality is demanding that we deal with, you know? I don't think they have pandemics and climate crisis and war and uh, economic demise in fantasy land, you know? Or if they do, they'll leverage it to their advantage. <laughs> so, yeah, think about that. So we need to be survivors. We need to get through this. We need to be strong. The times call for it. The circumstances call for it. So let's do it, okay? All right, talk to you soon, troopers. Keep marching. Bye.